When I was young, I was an asshole. <laughs> At the age of 17, I moved in with my grandparents so I could go to college. Grandma was a Norwegian ice princess. Beautiful, stoic, silently terrifying. <laughs> Grandpa was a funny, loudmouthed Italian with a curly mustache and a kind of regressive charm. Sort of a Guido caveman. <laughs> we drove from my childhood home in Colorado to San Diego in his old 66 Chevy pickup. We stayed in shitty motels, read the weekly world news, told dirty jokes, and drank Snapple while the miles rumbled past. Snapple was still a thing then. <laughs> when we crossed the California state border and the Welcome to California sign appeared, Granddad became suddenly serious. Son, there are three rules you need to abide to stay under our roof, he said, never taking his eyes off the road. Keep your grades up, he admonished gravely. I nodded. Always respect your grandma, he warned. Women should always be respected. I nodded. No fat girls in the pool, he said, <laughs> and snickered. And I rolled my eyes. In high school, I started to have dreams about guys. I began to notice certain feelings, but I couldn't allow myself to indulge them. They scared the shit out of me. I didn't know how to be a man that had these feelings. Instead, I wrenched on old cars with grandpa, started lifting weights, listened to heavy metal, skateboarded, rode a motorcycle, <laughs> dated girls. I did dude things, but women confused me. Relationships would end abruptly because I said the wrong thing or more likely hadn't said anything. <laughs> Nothing seemed straightforward or easy and my love life was a constant mess. Something inside me was changing. I was losing integrity between the man I wanted to be, the man everyone expected me to be, and the man I was becoming, but I kept trying. In college, I got a job at a mom and pop business I'd been there for a, a year or so when out of the blue, the wife came on to me. I came home from work that night feeling quietly bewildered. Another encounter with the ladies gone inexplicably wrong. I leaned heavily against the kitchen counter in the semi-darkness along with my confusion. I had been raised by quintessential men, but they couldn't help me now. Dad was three states away. Grandpa was here, but he was, well, he was Grandpa. And he was asleep, but not for long. He tottered out of, the, out of his bedroom in his customary saggy, tidy whities to get a glass of water. When he saw me brooding in the shadows, he asked me what was wrong. I told him about the night I had just had. He listened patiently. I felt grateful to share his company just then, to talk together as men. Then he put his hand on my shoulder and said, I'm sorry, son. Thanks, Grandpa, I said. And he patted my shoulder consolingly before making another less comforting proclamation. I'm disappointed in you. <laughs> if I'd had anything in my mouth besides bitter exhaustion, I would have spit it across the room. What? I asked, shocked. Why the hell are you disappointed in me? You didn't bang her, he said, eyes wide, arms outspread in disbelief. <laughs> Grandpa, she's my boss. She's twice my age. Son, you're a young man, and these broads need service. His fist stabbed the air with Italian emphasis. You have to service these horny broads. I would have. <laughs> Grandpa, she's married, I protested indignantly. She has a husband and a kid but he had already turned back to the bedroom muttering and shaking his head. He gave me one final piece of Grandpa George wisdom. God damn it, son, a ring doesn't close a hole. A ring doesn't close a hole.
from the mouths of 70 year olds. And now from mine, because I totally say that all the time. I realize what had to happen next. No more broads. It was time to jump into the deep end of Homo Lake. I was bad at girls. I couldn't possibly be worse at guys. I came out of the closet at age 23, and I was a terrible gay. I came from a family of incorrigible badasses. My dad was the epitome of red-blooded heterosexuality. A Vietnam veteran, a one-time sergeant at arms in the Mongols, a carpenter, a bruiser, and just a shit kicker. I was his oldest son. I wasn't gay. I couldn't be. I hated bars and clubs. Drag queens were terrifying to me, like vicious gender fuck sharknados. I couldn't put an outfit together or dance worth a shit. But I was gay, and I was really bad at it. My first real boyfriend looked like a storybook prince. He was tall, blonde, and handsome, and he spoke with a southern accent that charmed everyone he met. I did not look like a storybook prince. I looked more like a villain. <laughs> All hail Damien, my friends would say when I walked into a room. I was a brooder. I had rough edges. I used them to shield myself against this new terrifying part of my identity and to deflect others that exemplified it. I wasn't gay. I just happened to like guys. I was different. I didn't fit in. I was a dude apart, a singular man, a lone wolf with no equal. I was a homophobic tool. And I was a lot worse at guys. I had a big ego and low self-esteem, which it turns out is a super awesome combo for attracting quality men into your life. <laughs> Brian, my storybook prince, turned out to be more of a frog. We hadn't been together more than a few months when the three-way started. I was in love with him and I only wanted him. He wanted to sleep with other men. One day he gave me an ultimatum. I'll either do it with you or do it without you. I loved him. I wanted to make it work. I tried things his way for a while. When the day finally came, I moved out so suddenly I had to live in my shitty hatchback until I found a new place. Brian offered me a room. My pride would not allow me to stay. I put my belongings in storage and rolled around San Diego for a while, living in my ride. Like Jewel before she got a record deal. <laughs> but with drier lips. <laughs> the next romantic abortion was Dev. He was not a bastard. He was funny and cute and he doted on me. He looked like a pint-sized Tom Cruise. And ultimately he turned out to be just as crazy. <laughs> but we had so much in common. My family lived in Tucson, Dev's family lived in Tucson. I was a personal trainer, he went to the gym. He was a Buddhist, I liked the Beastie Boys. It was going to work between us, I just knew it. <sighs> oh, the fights, the glorious fights. I read a newspaper during a flight to Lake Tahoe, which to Dev meant I was shutting him out. He gave me the silent treatment for the first 24 hours of the trip, and then told me he was taking me to the airport so he could enjoy what was left of our weekend alone. I responded with icy Scandinavian calm and began packing my things. But this just stoked his anger. You're not going anywhere, he screamed, and he grabbed me roughly by the arms. In a blind rage, I picked him up and tossed him on the bed. 
It squeaked once under his weight, almost comically. And then he cried for two hours while I walked in the blinding snow, waiting for my fury to cool. Naturally, we married that spring. I could not understand what the problem was. I was a catch, right? I was a personal trainer and an EMT, two hot jobs. I was educated and funny and a great cook. I had all the cool mask dude bro things you put in your online dating profile. I could fix things. I could build things. Just not a relationship worth a shit. I swore off love for a while. It wasn't working. Mommy issues, check. Daddy issues, check. Gay son with a handful of failed relationships and an unshakable feeling there was nobody out there for him, checkmate. <laughs> grad school, grad school would be my new lover. I threw myself into my studies. I couldn't make love work, but my education, my career, what could go wrong? I got laid off at my job. I was fucked. Obviously, once I graduated with a Master of Fine Arts in film, I'd be knee-deep in money, fame, and Hollywood job offers. But in that moment, I was busted as hell. Wayne, a co-worker, came to my rescue. He was an older gay man, quiet, polite, and kind-hearted. I had no money. He rented me a room for $350. I went to college. He lived in the college area. I was lazy. He had a pool. Score! <laughs> On a Saturday morning, shortly after I moved in, I rolled out of bed in my underwear and stumbled sleepily towards the bathroom. A woman who looked like old-timey Elizabeth Taylor was standing in front of the mirror, primping her hair. I apologized to her for my near-nakedness. Sorry, ma'am, I didn't realize Wayne had guests. She looked at me. She was beautiful. She was glamorous. She was a man. <laughs> JD, it's Wayne, she intoned in a voice way too deep to be made by lady parts. A chill ran down my spine. I was living with a drag queen. Life went on. I got over my fear of drag queens because I live with one. Turns out those bitches are hilarious. In film school, I was surrounded by flamboyant creative types, actors and the like, and I got over my fear of them too. I made friends. I tried wearing pink once. I stopped taking myself so seriously and loosened up a little. I also got lonely. I wanted to meet someone, but I was terribly suited to meeting people. I hated bars and other settings where such meetings would be probable. For all my progress, I still battled with the misanthropic jerk inside who didn't get along with other gay men. I looked for all the things we didn't have in common. I found reasons we were different. I judged. I created distance. I was a terrible gay. I was a gay beta fish. There were a few short-lived flings, but nothing stuck. I broke it off every time. Nobody seemed quite right. I persisted in my studies, all the while hoping, with quiet yearning, that I'd meet the right guy. But the degree program dragged on. After a couple of thesis extensions, I realized I was using my education as a reason not to become involved with someone. It was convenient bullshit. I like you, I do. I just have to focus on my education right now. It was a familiar refrain. I'd once broken up with a guy because as I told him, I think you're a great guy, I really do. But I really need to focus on my martial arts training right now. <laughs> I was that asshole. I was that guy who said those things. I was a douche fag. <laughs> the irony struck me hard. I 
wasn't the right guy. I had complained loudly about unavailable twats, not realizing until years had passed that I was one of them. I was the king of unavailable twats. This revelation was a tectonic shift in my life. I don't push gay people away anymore. I treasure my gay friends, which are many now. I have the privilege of sharing this stage with a few of them tonight. I think drag queens are hilarious and fascinating. I love divey gay bars for the cheap drinks and the great people watching. I still hate dance clubs though, so riches can lick it. <laughs> but my friends have been known to drag me, brag me out there from time to time. And when I just fucking relaxed and stopped trying to meet Mr. Wright, I actually met him. His name is Vince with an S. That's fucking sexy, right? He's my best friend. We spoil each other. We tease each other. We know each other on purpose and play what my dad calls grab ass. We have the same sick sense of humor, and I love his dogs, and he cuddles like a champ. We watch RuPaul's Drag Race, and then we watch Vikings. He takes me out to bars to go dancing. I take him out to the desert to go camping. We call each other baby, and tiger, and pumpkin, and other things so cute and disgusting, my friends threaten to puke when they hear it. And I don't care. Grandpa likes him. <laughs> Grandma would have loved him too. I love him. I was wrong. Being with guys hasn't been easier, but it's better. And I still don't really fit in, but that's not because I'm gay. Some people would say I'm still an asshole. But fuck those people. <laughs> love isn't always sweet, but it sustains me. I love and I am loved the way I am. <laughs>